Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where I meet interesting maritime professionals, sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gosberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast lovers. Welcome to the 89th episode of the Shipping Podcast, where I will be introducing you to Dorothea Ioannou. She's the managing director and global business developer of the Ship Owners Claims Bureau, which is a part of the American P&I Club. I met Dorothea in Piraeus when I was there on the 15th of March and visited her in her offices. If you go to the Facebook page of the Shipping Podcast, you can see a small video of the harbor, the port of Piraeus which I filmed when I was on the balcony where Dorothea has her offices. It's beautiful. You should definitely have a look. So I know Dorothea since before. We have met through Vista. And I was so pleased that I get a chance to go and see her. And um, she talks about a lot of things to which I agree. So I won't keep it from you any longer. This is Dorothea Iannou. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. My name is Dorothy Ayuanu, and I am the Chief Commercial Officer for the American P&I Club. I am also the Global Business Development Director, and I also run the Greek office of the managers of the club. Um, the club, for those who don't know, are a third-party liability insurer for ships. So that means that we handle and cover matters such as pollution, cargo damage, if somebody of the crew gets injured on the ship, a collision. So anything where the operator or the ship itself would have responsibility for some kind of a damage to somebody else, that's where we get involved. And we are also a member of the international group of P&I clubs, which ensures just about 90% of the world's fleet. So what is your background? What's my background? I am a lawyer, born and raised in New York. I came to Greece in 1997, started working in uh, law firms. I didn't, never had any particular specialty. I just did a general juris, juris doctorate at, from St. John's University in New York and um, sort of got into shipping by chance, actually. Sort of uh, came to Greece, realized that I wasn't going to be able to compete with other Greek lawyers in the courts because... The official language wasn't English. <laughs> and while I speak Greek, I have a Greek background. I was not of the caliber of the, you know, of the, the lawyers of Greece. And so I just started to research things and decided to shift into shipping and started working at a Greek law firm, actually doing shipping law originally, before I eventually networked and found my way into marine insurance through actually a, a WISTA Member. She's actually on the Wista Halas board right now, Ioana Tapalablu, and she gave me my first shot and gave me a job in a marine insurance broking firm. So, yeah, so my background is a legal background, but I don't practice law anymore. <laughs> well, when I entered this office, I was amazed to see so many women in here. Yes, um, you know, it, we are very well known for that, actually. This office is uh, well known in Piraeus and actually probably on a global level now in the marine insurance industry. We now have... 12 people that work in our office, and out of the 12, 10 are women. Now, I can, I can take credit for that and say I did that on purpose, right? <laughs> I didn't actually do it on purpose. What happened simply was when each time we had an opening and I would interview people, the best candidates for those positions out of the pool that I was seeing just happened to be generally women, and they, they fit what it was we were looking for I mean, I look at things a little bit more. I don't only look at what's on a piece of paper. When I interview people, I look into their eyes. I look at the body language. I see whether they click with us, whether their demeanor is something that will match because I believe that one of the biggest parts of a successful office is the chemistry with people and the attitude that people have. And I try and gauge it. I don't get it right every single time, okay? Because we have, you know, you know, sometimes you have turnover. But generally, I have a good feeling for that, and I look for good people, nice people, 
in addition to having the qualifications. <laughs> so Yeah, but we are a people's industry. Exactly, exactly. Our clients are also people with relations and, and they need to meet people who can relate to them. Yeah, exactly. Look, especially in, in, in P&I and in marine insurance, I'll give you an example of why that is absolutely true. In the international group of P&I clubs, all the clubs have the same cover, okay? We all provide the same service. Some of us are bigger, some of us are smaller, but ultimately we do the same thing, okay? What ends up differentiating each club, which becomes a part of their brand, is their personality and how well they click with the particular ship owner. So certain clubs are maybe more attuned to the larger publicly traded, whereas other clubs are more attuned and akin to the smaller family operated. We're more like that. Um, we are more of the mid-sized to smaller, although we tend to have also uh, certain sections of larger publicly traded as well. But it all comes down to when you sit down with somebody, do they want to work with you? Because a P&I club is a people business. It's not like your car insurance where you just, you have damage, the surveyor comes, he figures it out, he pays you. That's not what it's about. The P&I, what the owner expects is that from day one when he has a problem, you're there, you're next to him, you are the expert, you're giving him, because as a P&I club, we're exposed to thousands and thousands and thousands of, of incidents. So we have m many more resources to pull in from to give them that advice. And so part of what they're looking for is the person that's going to sit down with them at the table and work with them and find a solution. We're solution providers, right? So if you don't have that good rapport, if you don't have that good connection, if they don't like you, it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. recognize that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what are the biggest changes that you have seen in, in the shipping industry? I think it, not only for the shipping industry, but um, probably across a lot of different sectors, I would think that the biggest change that's going on right now is regulation, is the supervision, is stricter controls. More, I don't want to, I don't like to use the word burdensome, but it is to a certain extent because it's not, and it's not just about money. It's about the human resources that we have. And it's about putting also, it's a little bit more strenuous for everybody that they can't just concentrate on doing their jobs. They also have to think about the regulatory framework within which they do their jobs. And when I started in this industry, you would have a lawyer that took care of that, right? You'd have one person that took care of that and sort of, you don't have to worry about it. You just concentrate on doing your job. You really can't just concentrate on just doing your job now. The training that goes on, at least in our company, in terms of regulatory awareness, whether it's sanctions, whether it's uh, now GDPR, whether it's security issues. I mean, the American Club, starting from about four years ago, our IT had already started implementing a security awareness training program. So like we have to constantly stay up to date. We, we do like um, webinars, we have to take tests, and we have to show that we understand what they're teaching us. So this takes, this takes time, and it takes time across the board. So now, whereas you used to just concentrate on doing, you, you know, your little section of your job, and for mainly the people in this office, let's say in Greece, was just doing claims, now they have a lot more on their plate. And I think the ship owners are feeling that as well, obviously, because it really goes across all industries. In the beginning, it started just with banking, but it's not just a banking issue anymore. It's an issue for everybody. Everybody has responsibility for the regulatory framework. And I think, for me, that is the biggest challenge going forward, especially for people of my generation that are not so used to that. I think the new generation will probably have it easier because it's probably going to be incorporated into the mind frame of how they're trained, you know, and the courses that they take and school. I see the change that's happening even with our interns, the things that they learn. I never learned, you know. So I think really it's the, it's the regulatory framework to a certain extent, globalization, the, the element of sanctions, conflicting laws, whereas, you know, we're always trying to become more uniform. We just don't seem to do it. We just don't seem to manage to do it. I've even found that even in the EU, that even with EU directives, not every single country has the know-how within their countries to implement it in the same manner. So conflicting implementation and regulation, I think, is the, is the greatest challenge and I think it's the biggest shift yeah I, and that that goes across all things even and then there's also the aspects of safety that's a good thing I think the aspects of safety that are changing the stricter supervision although in my experience unfortunately I think that most countries or most authorities 
tend to be reactive as opposed to proactive, and they take an incident and then they try and create regulation that applies to that instance as opposed to looking at things from a whole. That's my experience, and probably people that disagree with me, that's how I've seen it. And sometimes they go too far, I think. But how do you see the future then? I mean, there are so many technical developments yeah. now. It's digitalization. It's digitalization in many forms. And it goes not only from a technical perspective in terms of how you operate the ship, but how you operate your business on the shore. And I think what I've been seeing recently, and I'm going to be speaking tomorrow in, uh, at a university here in Greece, and I think that if you don't embrace that as a new generation, you will, I don't think you'll be able to adapt in any industry. I think that's just the methodology. I did a report the other day to the board, even in terms of marketing. Digital content marketing is the way of the future to reach people and to have them understand who you are and what your brand is. The traditional, you know, advertising, it just, it, it just doesn't, it's I'm, just nowhere. I'm yeah. so happy you say that oh, because yeah. that is what I'm preaching. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I absolutely believe that. And I tell, I tell every single young person that I meet that they need to embrace that change. If they don't learn how to adapt to that methodology in every single sector, it doesn't matter what you do. If you don't embrace that, you will not have a place in the future. I bring in interns so that we can adapt to that because it's very hard for somebody like me to understand it right away. I need people to, I need the younger people to help me understand that and to actually take over those small tasks that will help us take Um, the next step. Yeah, and I can he I hear from the young people that they see me as a, an advocate for them oh, because wow. the more mature people listen to me because they know that I am delivering. I've always been delivering. I'm not just talking right rubbish. Right. I, no. I am talk. I know what I'm talking about, but. The more mature people do not listen enough to the young people. So they see me as sort of a bridge or yeah, for me to explain to yeah. the elderly people, <laughs> mostly men. Yes, mostly men. <laughs> You're right. What it's all about. One of my questions is to you, how could we make the shipping industry more visible ah. to the general public? You know, I think that we are on the right track. I think you're on the right track. You've been doing a lot uh, with that. I think that uh, organizations like Wista do a really good job with that. I think organizations like BIMCO have been doing. Uh, I think that everybody that plays a role as an industry voice, in my opinion, has that responsibility. And I think, I mean... I feel like I have that responsibility. It's hard for me sometimes to do all the things that I want to do. There's so much, I have so much work to do. But I really try and make an effort to carve out time. Also, like tomorrow, I'm going to go speak at the universities. I speak at the Greek universities as well, not just the international ones. I speak at institutes. I think that anybody that has somewhat of a leading role in any organization, whether private or public or NGOs or whatever type of business, I think that it's, it's, it's all of our responsibility to sort of share that and, and create awareness. You know, I am also the type of person that believes that the internet has good and bad, obviously. I think that there's a lot of negative things that have come out of the internet, but there are also a lot of positive things. One of them is our ability to reach so many people through one little tiny outlet And I think that we're seeing that I, every single day that I even looked on LinkedIn, I see more and more information being disseminated. And it's very exciting. I learn things like that. Me I too. learn. Yeah. Me and I'll, I'll click on those those links and I'll learn a little bit more. And then what I'll do is if I find something that is related to us here, something that I think that we need to investigate, I might not have the time to do it. That's why I have my interns. That's why I have the rest of the team. And not only here in Greece, we have six offices across the globe, and I'll assign it to people, and I'll tell them, research this and give me a report in order to evaluate where that might play a role in, in, in our business or in something more that we want to do. But I think, I don't, I don't know, I think about that. I don't think we can do anything else, but then each person take on a little bit of the responsibility to become a voice. I agree. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes it's like we see this wonderful industry and we have such passion for it. Yeah. But we forget to tell people outside because we talk to each other about it. Yes, that's and, true. That's and we true. know all about it. And if I say something, someone else will say, yeah, I know that. So yes. it's, it's not that important. <laughs> But if I tell the same thing to someone outside, they will say, wow. Yeah. Is that what you do? 
Yeah, it's true. They get very impressed, don't they? And, and we sort of take it, some people like us, we take it a little bit for granted. I mean, in Greece, I think they're doing quite a good job because, I mean, it is the largest sector that we have. And so what, what you're finding is there are a lot of nonprofit organizations that are spreading the word about, about shipping. There are a lot of individuals that I know, even within WISTA, that are taking the laboring ore on that and spreading it across the people that never had, that had no clue what it is. That yeah, it's all and, about. and also, I mean, for young people, we are going to compete with every other industry for the brightest. That's right. Because we need them in our industry. Of course we do. And we need every single type of educated individual. And that's the, that's the message I'm going to be giving tomorrow. Because as I was preparing for this talk tomorrow, I was thinking, you know, people have to understand that the shipping industry is not just what goes on on those ships right outside my balcony here, you know, in the port of Piraeus. You know, it's not just about being a seafarer or being a ship owner, okay? Because that, people tend to have this image that that's all, all of what it's about. But it's not. There's a whole service sector. But even within the ship management, you need finance people. You need accountants. You need marketing people. You need lawyers, obviously. I, I made a list the other day. Besides just the, the, the technical people, I have a statistician. You need IT people. You need security specialists, right? I read a, um, an ad the other day on LinkedIn from one of the other IG clubs that's looking for a solution architect. Do you know what that is? I learned what it is after reading the advertisement. <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> Apparently, it's related to the technological development and the support that they need to run the global operation. It's mm. related to IT, but not only. It's about providing solutions, which is what really... So what's IT about, right? So IT is not just some person that knows how to fix your computer. It's somebody that has vision. It's somebody that understands what you're doing and wants to help you do it easier, right? That, that's a solution provider. So I think you could study almost anything and still get into shipping in, in some manner or form. Now we have departments dedicated to social media. You could become a digital marketer and go join any one of the companies in the service industry of maritime. And it's probably a lot more interesting and more exciting and more creative than some of the other industries, right? Than just selling some products from a retailer, right? And, and there is a great demand because there, are hard, there is hardly anyone exactly. at this time. Yeah. We're training people now. We're yeah. create, we've created a social media division within my department of business development because, you know, you didn't think about that, that you would need that, but you need it. You yeah. need it. Because how else are people going to under, how else are you going to spread your message? You need people that understand the medium, you know? We, we're training people on using all sorts of software so that we can become much faster, be, you know, facilitate and process our information in a much more effective way, that we can analyze our data. That's another one, uh, a job of the future, data analyst. Number one, in my opinion, any person I speak to, I tell them, Learn how to be a data analyst. I said, I'll give you a job. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's coming. And uh, I'm so glad to, to hear that yeah. you realize this yeah. because not a lot of people do. It depends yeah. on... Maybe it depends also on where they are within the sector yes. and what they do. And it's a mindset. It is a mindset. I mean, for me, part of my job in terms of being the commercial officer, so part of my job is how do I bring everything together so that I can have a picture and understand where I want to go. Well, the only way to do that is to collect and process information that helps you understand the performance of your business. And there's lots of different ways you can measure that. So I constantly have to think of new ways how to measure that because it's not only about the bottom line, it's about how you're getting to the bottom line, right? So you have to understand all the processes in between and it's also about understanding human performance, okay? So how do you measure that? How do you get that clear picture? Well, it all, it all comes down to digitalization. I'm it all comes down to being able to easily process information and making the jobs for people easier. And, you know, for me, that, that's the most exciting part of my job right now. I spent almost 18 years handling casualties, right? That's really what I did. That's how I built my credibility. Through that, I met so many people in the industry. And eventually, you know, people started to associate my face or my voice, let's say, with the voice of the American club, especially in this region. And it helped me make a shift into, you know, really taking a part of where the business is going. And for me, it's been the most exciting part of everything I do, figuring out uh, the strategy and 
creating the vision and helping us get there and then helping figuring out everybody's role of figuring out where people want to fit in, where they best fit in, and how to coordinate it within the whole organization. For me, that's the most exciting part. <laughs> I love that part. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> we have a similar background, even though you have been here and in the club and so on. Because I used to be an underwriter. Oh, I that's used to right. be a marine insurance broker, and then I used to be an underwriter. So, right. I so got you the, get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Well, you know, like when I first started in this business in the 90s, the marketing was an underwriter just going from office to office. It's, it doesn't work like that anymore. No, it doesn't. No. no. And it can't. No, of it course can't. not. It can't. Of course not. We also have to be efficient and we yes. have to be, yeah. Yeah. It's a whole network. It's a whole network of people that feed, they feed the center. And then, you know, you have to create something with that center. And I mean... I actually, going back to my background, when I was uh, growing up, I was very artistic and I draw very well. And so I had two options. I had gotten into art school and I had gotten into, well, in the United States, law is a second degree, but I was going to political science and for law. And I had a very strict uh, Greek father who was, you know, who said to me, no, you have to be a professional. And if you become an artist, you're going to starve. So I got scared and I went the, the route of law. But this part of the business um, helps me bring back that creative side. And, you know, because for me, I'm painting a picture. When I'm creating the strategy and I'm creating a vision and I'm trying to figure out the role that everybody can play and, and actually and, and maybe even giving them more interesting things to do within their jobs, it's like painting a picture. So that for me is, is exciting. And last fall, you were awarded last oh, fall. Oh, yes. Okay. For the next generation. The next generation, yes. That was probably, I have to say, one of the most exciting moments, I would say, of my career. Not of my life, because my life was the birth of my daughter. But of my career, that was probably the most, I was really overwhelmed. I didn't, when it was first suggested to me to be nominated, I said to, which, uh, which was, my business development director for the Americas, which is Boriana Farrar, who I thank very greatly, of course, was her idea with the support of, of our CEO and our COO, Vincent Cho. And they said to me, you know, we want to nominate you. And I sort of, my first instinct was, nominate me? What? I haven't done anything to deserve that. I, really, I couldn't, I couldn't think what, out of, you know, because it's a global award. It's not just a regional award. It's a global award. And she said, Boriana said to me, Dorothea, Give me a book. Just write down your story. Just write it down. Write down what, you, what you've done. And then we'll talk about whether you, you, you should be nominated. And it was probably the most enlightening exercises that I've ever had to do. Because when I started to write, I actually started to remember even, you know, some of the little things. And you start to figure out, okay, I didn't, maybe I didn't, I don't do everything. Obviously, we're an organization and without the team, and I say that so strenuously all the time, I have good people and without the right team, you can't do anything. But I saw some things that I put into motion, you know, I saw some things that I pushed or that, that I helped happen. And it was, it was really, it was very exciting. It was very gratifying when I found out, you know, <laughs> You know, when I won, I, I, my, I was really shaking up there. I really, and I had, I had prepared in my mind because I thought, what, okay, what if I get it? I should be prepared. But really, it was probably was the most, one of the most overwhelming things. And then, you know, because then all of a sudden you're, you're the next generation from marine insurance. You represent this industry. And it was, it was exciting. For a little while, it was a little stressful, though, because then I was thinking, okay, now what, you know? <laughs> Where do you go from there? You can't go anywhere from there. <laughs> of course you can. But, but I mean, it takes leadership to yeah. have the right people working with you. Yeah, but you know something? I was having this conversation the other day about leadership. I, wa I see all of these, um, these talks and these coaching um, seminars and these people on LinkedIn and even in this industry, they do all these talks on leadership. How to be a great leader, how to be a great leader. You know what I say? how to be a great person. If you can be a great person, if you can be a great colleague, if you can be a great employee, if you can be a great friend, if you can be a great coworker, it's the, the same principles. Eventually, the leadership will happen. And one of the things that I talked about when I got the award was I never had a plan to be 
let's say even just to run the Greek office of the American Club or to run any big organization. I never had a plan. For me, I, o- I only looked one step at a time. So like when I got into the industry, it was get my foot in the door, get into the industry. Oh, okay, I'm in the marine insurance. So now I'm on the claim, I do the claims. Okay, so maybe I can run this department. And then from running the department, maybe I can become the legal counsel. Maybe I can, you know, then you get into the club. I was a claims executive. I was, you know, I was mid-level exec. I never thought when I came, I didn't make a plan. I just never made a plan. My plan was always be nice, be patient, be good to the people around you. Because when you're good to the people around you, they want to be good to you and they want to help you. Be authentic. Just be who you are. And even if you have to say something that maybe people won't like, if you say it in a nice way, they'll respect it. Especially, I'm talking about on the job, right? For the work that you're doing. Because then otherwise it doesn't have value if you're not going to really say what you think. And everything just falls into place. So like if you're nice to people, they want to work with you. And if you get people involved in what you're doing, then the rest of it just, it just sort of happens. And if you get an idea, share it. And don't be afraid to bring smart people around you. There are some people that they don't like to have smart people. I want people around me that are smarter than I am. When, when I eventually went up the ladder here and I had to hire the next claims manager, okay? Because I was going to move into, eventually I was moving into the management and to do more on business development. And I needed somebody that could eventually take over the claims because there's only so much you can juggle. And I was, and I was interviewing. And our, our claims manager now, Joanna Kukuli, She's triple qualified. She was working for a, a major publicly traded uh, container ship. And while she didn't have as much experience as I did, she certainly had better education than I did. And she probably had a, a different type of experience. And I could see right away that she was really sharp, very smart. And I said, this is who I want. So I want somebody better than me, you know. And everybody I try and hire, I hire, I try and find something that's more than me. Even if they're young, there's something always that's more than me, more than the other person I hired, because that's the only way that you can grow. And the other, and the, and the other thing that's really important that we have to remember as leaders is that if we don't let some things go, the person behind you cannot move up. It's very important to let go of some things and move on to the next stage. Did you have a role model growing up? Did I have a role model? Ah, okay. I was, I had, my grandmother was my first role model who really instilled in me the basic principles of being a kind, being a good person and um, always holding my head up high, being proud. This is what she would say to me. You need to be proud, but not arrogant. And it's a, there's a fine line between pride and, and arrogance. So she was my first role model. And with my mother as well, who always told me when I was younger as well, you know, always respect people that are above you, but don't think that they know more than you. Yeah. Always research everything. Um, you're, you know, always have confidence in yourself and question. Don't be obnoxious and don't be rude, but don't be afraid to research and question what people are, are telling you. And if you think that something is significant enough to challenge it. So those were my first two role models. In fact, my grandmother instilled so much of a sense of pride. And um, I guess she made me feel special as a person that she would say to me when I, you know, when I was very little, I originally say, oh, I'm going to be a, a lawyer. I was very vocal as a child. <laughs> and she would say, you're not just going to be a lawyer. She would say to me, you're, you're going to become the first president of First woman president of the United States, she would say to me. And I would say, Grandma, I can't do it. You can do anything that you want to do if you put your mind to it. And it's very funny because I always use that, you know, I always say that to people that my grandmother, she's, she's still waiting, you know. <laughs> she's still waiting and I still have time. I always tell people, you never know, you never know. Do you see yourself as a role model now? I do see myself as a role model now. And I've, I've seen myself as a role model also for my daughter for her whole life. And being a working mom, and especially for me, after a certain point, I was a single parent. You get the guilt trips and you get the, you get the difficulties of balancing the career and the, and the home life, right? And, you know, I, I have so much guilt, you know, working so much. And, but one of the things that I learned was that if you set the right example for your children, that's a, that, that is the most valuable lesson that they can learn by watching you and seeing what you do, it creates a vision for them. At least you hope that it does, right? 
So I've always tried to do things, like I said, the right way, be respectful, and I always try and help people because when I came to this country, I knew nobody, okay? I absolutely knew no one. I didn't have any friends. I followed my then husband, and like I said, I got into the shipping industry by chance because it was just the best option for me. Not everybody helped me. Not everybody wanted to give me a shot. And I know that there are some people in this world that think, well, nobody helped me. Why should I help? But I don't, I can't do that. What I think like is, well, I know how they feel. If, you know, I know how they feel that they feel so lost. They feel despair. And if I can help them, I'm going to, I'm going to help them. And I, I try and pass that on because if we pass that on, people become better people. And you just have a nicer environment wherever you are. I think one of the greatest things that I tried to pass on to my daughter and to the, and the people I work with everywhere is just to be, try to be generous. And I don't mean generous with money. I mean generous with who you are, with your time, with, with sharing your information. Because, you know, we're not going to be here forever. So then what happens to it, you know? <laughs> so... I do think, I do, now I think of myself as a role model. I probably didn't think so much of it career-wise until the, the most recent years, but I always felt it from a family with my daughter. You know, I always felt that I had to be a role model there. You are a role model. I can tell you that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so who do you think I should meet the next? Who, does, who would you be interested in listening to? Oh, you know who I would, you should go interview my original mentor. You met her yesterday, Joanna Topalulu, who is the treasurer of... Uh, Wista Halas. Now she's been, she started really from very, like she was, she was in this business. Like when I started in this business 20 years ago, there were hardly any women in the P&I sector. Now there's a lot more women, especially on the service side, on the claim side and stuff. We're not so many on the very top yet, by the way. There's probably five of us on the very top out of all the 13 clubs, okay? Yes, I think I counted them on the one hand. But when Joanna started uh, before me, it was really just a whole different world. And it would probably be really interesting to listen to what she has to say of how this industry changed when she started and up until today. I mean, I was very lucky to have her as a mentor. I mean, this office is mainly women. That office was mainly women as well. There was like 10 people, nine of them were women as well. And I remember one of the things she taught me was, Dorothy, I know you're a lawyer. I know you have experience in New York. I know you're smart. And you're going to learn a lot, she says. But the one thing you should know is that no matter how much you know or how much you think you know, you're always going to have a lot to learn. And I've always kept that. Um, and she's right. We still learn every day, right? We still learn every day. So I think she would be a really good person to interview. I will try and catch her. Yes, okay. Either maybe. now or maybe, or maybe in Tromsø when we oh, go to that. That's a good idea. In October, I hope. That's a good idea. But I think, yeah, she would be... She's the first person that pops into, okay. into my mind. Yeah, yeah. and I want, uh, I want female guests, as many as I can. Yes, definitely. Because I'm trying to have 50-50, mm -hmm. unlike other media. Yeah. yeah, and I know you're making a big effort to, put, uh, to get women on panels. And that's always been one of, one of my gripes in the past as well, which now we're seeing this nice shift. In, we, we, the American Club participated in CMA, and we did our own seminar. And the whole panel was uh, female. I saw yeah. that. I saw that in social media <laughs> those yesterday. Are, yes, those are our next, look, that's our next generation. And I, the other thing that I believe is that it's our responsibility to create our talent pool. If we don't create our talent pool, business is going to go nowhere. We have to think about tomorrow. It's all part of sustainability. You, ha you have to create that, that pool. So we now, the, one of the things that I did last year was we've implemented a global internship program. So every single department has to have an intern because that's the only way that you're going to create the pool, right? Yeah. Even if you don't hire them, it doesn't really matter. You, because if, if everybody does that, then there's going to be somebody somewhere that's going to fit your needs in the mm. future. Mm. Yeah. Exciting. How does your uh, clients look upon you as you have so many female uh, employees? They love, it. <laughs> they love it. 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 Yeah, I think that they love it. They love to come here. Our office is always open. The nice thing about the American Club is that we, well, we're one of the smaller clubs, so but we tend to know each and every member by name, and they know us. They know each and every one of us, and I think that is our brand anyway, and that's what makes us uh, special. And that's the part I don't want to lose. No matter how we change or how we grow, I don't want to lose that. So that's also part of my vision. Mm. Thank you very much, Dorothea. Thank you, thank you for your time. Yeah, no, thank you for coming. It was a pleasure and an honor.
definitely to become a part of your team of uh, podcast speakers. Thank you. Wasn't that fabulous? I think Dorothea made really a great impact on me, and I hope that you listen to her advice. She knows what she's talking about. I am currently on vacation, and what difference it makes to be outside and doing some editing and um, then just to pop inside a summer house and do some more of this podcast episode for you. This is the 89th. So there are 10 to go to the 100th. But I'm starting to plan it now. And I have bagged 10 more episodes. So they are in pipeline for you. I wish I had more feedback from you what you want to listen to in the future and how you want this podcast to develop. My ideas are all over the place, but I think I need to do some changes once I've done 100. Because things that doesn't develop, they stand still. And that's not usually my trademark anyhow. So continue to spread the word for me. Continue to write reviews because that makes this podcast climb on the top lists and people to stumble upon it and start to listen to all these people who have so much passion for their jobs and who works in the most interesting industry there is. I will leave you with this. Until the next time, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry. 